without further ado, I'd like to pass across to, uh, to Jessica Thorne, who's going to give a presentation on future scenarios of infrastructure driven land use and socio ecological transformations. Over to you, Jessica. Um, all yours. Thank you so much, Rob, and good morning, everybody. Um, so I am a researcher at the University of York Department of Environment and Geography, and I'm honored to have the opportunity for the next 20 minutes to share with you some of the work that's an ongoing project in partnership with a range of researchers and practitioners which have contributed to these results. The focus of the discussion is a journey across different temporal scales and spatial scales, thinking about past, present and future scenarios of infrastructure driven land use and socio-ecological transformations. By way of overview, I will first discuss how changes in investments in Africa are occurring at a very rapidly and driven both at the, from domestic actors and from foreign direct investments. Then I will share a new tool that we have, de we have developed at the continental level to assess the spatial temporal distribution and potential impacts of infrastructure investments. Then we'll learn from the past and discuss how historic drivers of infrastructure have driven land use change. Think about the present in the last 10 years or so to discuss the challenges in the effectiveness of tools to evaluate environmental and social impacts of infrastructure investments and look into the future of how we propose new tools which can help to get ahead of the problem before it arises. The main point that I would like to argue for is that, and I'd like you to take home, is that the future has the potential for something to be very different and we are suggesting tools which can help envision transformative futures. As mentioned, I represent the Development Corridors Partnership, and so this work represents outcomes of these collaborations and is very much a work in progress with the potential to be evolved. Given that we would like to use this opportunity as a dis uh, uh, to discuss and hear from our Kenyan colleagues who work at the coal face of where the best ideas really emerge, I won't go into the details of the methods employed, but this work has arisen from a robust methodology and applied through workshops, field visits, interviews, and spatial modeling between 2018 and 2020. If you'd like to find out more details about this, it, this represents the foundation of four papers, a chapter, and a one business brief with UNEP. And I have chosen to focus at the landscape scale rather than going into the nuanced dynamics of our case study in Kenya. And this is because this has been the focus of other uh, webinars in the series. But first, let's get to know our audience. Uh, Laura will now show in front of you a, a uh, poll and please will you answer the questions around if you've ever done scenario planning in the past. So investment in infrastructure globally is at an all-time high. In recent decades, Africa has seen an accelerating construction of complex infrastructure networks and this large-scale expansion of infrastructure in the form of development corridors is profoundly reshaping the geographies of Africa, regenerating uh, the lock-in patterns of development for future generations. On the one hand, this promotes transformational change in the form of to mitigate and adapt to climate change, often described as dreamscapes of modernity and showcases of future masking. But on, on the other hand, it creates significant biodiversity loss and habitat fragmentation. It consumes large amounts of greenhouse gas emissions and intensive products such as steel and cement. It can lead to conflicts across national boundaries, massive transformations in local livelihoods, and are often fraught with anxieties of social negotiations and contestations. So not only what we invest in, but how we do investment remains a significant challenge at every stage of, from planning, design, implementation, operation, monitoring, and decommissioning. And moreover, with climate change, will likely infra impact infrastructure. So this image from our brief shows, for example, how surface water flooding will destroy roads, railways, pipelines, and ports. There could be water canal blockages or waterway diversions or downstream sedimentation. So understanding how development corridor impacts is, is critical for the attainment not only of of local goals, but also of the sustainable development goals and the African Union Agenda 2063. Africa's current infrastructure gap is situated against a long history of underinvestment. For example, only 1% of railways worldwide are in Africa. There are major electricity deficits and only 5% of the continent has access to irrigated agriculture. So to overcome this major gap associated largely with transport and energy, as shown over here, we need to close the investment gap. 
And currently, the average investment is about 3.5% of GDP per country in Africa since 2000. But this needs to be increased to 4.5. And this is still less than if you consider other countries such as China or India. So in view of these dynamics, international investors are growing a considerable appetite to invest in Africa. Between 2013 and 2017, the annual funding for infrastructure development was $77 billion, which is double, which was that between 2000 and 2006. And we still need to double this by another to another 150 billion in the next five years. And this is particularly um, important in the context of the Belt and Road initiatives and the promises of the G7 to build back better. So consequently, there are new players on the stage. We see when analyzing for FDI data across Africa that China is among the top five sources of investments. And this investment is growing substantially in the last 15 years. And some of the largest recipients on the continent include Kenya. However, understanding the scope and impact of development corridors on people and nature remains challenging. Contributing to this is a lack of fine-grained data that systematically disaggregates and can be compared across space and time. The challenge is that development corridors have really de demarcated boundaries, titles, stages of evolution or duration. Meanwhile, there are also implementation gaps, especially in terms of the, the application of best, best practic, pra practice mitigation. There's contradictory, scattered and ambiguous information is subject to manipulation depending on the priorities, diverse interests and outcomes. And this poses severe challenges, not only at the local scale, for example, for environmental practitioners tasked with time with undertaking EIAs, but also at the global level where international assessments such as the Global Environmental Outlook or the International Panel on Biodiversity and Ecosystem Services rely on inaccurate information. So there's a clear need of, of data, which leads to three key, key, six key challenges, governance, coordination and transparency difficulties, inefficiencies in operations and maintenance, the need to spend budgets quickly amidst a high complexity and the need to achieve value for money, scale mass mismatches, for example, national interests outweigh local welfare in many cases, or trade-offs across sectoral domains, for example, in economic interests outweigh land conversion. Governments and private players need to set up and prepare, plan and manage projects with a new level of rigor and robustness. So at the continental scale, we conducted, we developed a new tool to assess the spatial temporal distribution of impact. And this is the development corridor database that's about to be submitted to nature scientific data. There are a robust methodology that is understanding growth corridors and, and, and we believe that this is one way to assess this impact and will be available globally to the environmental community, to the global environmental change community. We found that there are 88 corridors across Africa representing 184 car projects. This is about 148,000 kilometers, which is a linear distance 3.7 times the Earth's circumference. When looking at the, the impact, the distance per country, the largest investments are South Africa and Tanzania, followed by Namibia, Angola, and the Democratic Republic of Congo. When looking at the number of projects per country, we see that the, num the greatest number of investments are in Kenya, Tanzania, and, and DRC. And in terms of what constitutes these corridors, these are predominantly roads, followed by ports and passenger and freight railway systems. We found that since the 1800s, investments have grown exponentially. Spike's investments grew particularly around the 1900, when there was a wave of new imperialism, followed by the 1960s, when many countries across sub-Saharan Africa gained independence. And more recently, in the last 15 to 10 years, with, with investments associated to foreign direct investments. And clearly, there's an exponential rise in the, if you look at the 50-year periods. So how much and who is investing? We estimate the total investment sum is about $549 billion to $658 billion. And the average investment is about $3.5 to $4.1 billion. But if you compare this to the average GDP in Sub-Saharan Africa, which is 1.5, this is a substantial amount. But we acknowledge this is probably only the tip of the iceberg, given our data that is available. We've seen a rising spending is coming principally from regional development banks, about 30%, and African governments. And when looking at who is funding this, it's predominantly the African Development Bank, the World Bank, 
governments followed by international regional banks such as the Export Import Bank of China, the European Investment Bank and the Arab Bank for Economic Development in Africa. But the significance of corridors does not have an equal impact in all places. For instance, as development corridors enter into more remote areas, the significant increases, depending on the environmental sensitivity, the social context and the level of economic development. With our analysis on the intersection of these corridors in protected areas, it's likely to be an area the size of Sweden, which the largest area intersecting, if you look at a 20 kilometer buffer, would be Tanzania, South Africa, Namibia, Kenya and Ethiopia. So this is really critical to understand if we are to improve the sustainability of these investments in the future. And at the local scale, one of the, ma the most ambitious infrastructure developments on the continent is, is the Kenya Standard Gauge Railway. It falls under the blueprint of the 2030 vision and the part of the Peltama Road Initiative. And it's captured the imagination of the population of Kenya, the wider East African community, and indeed the world. And there are many promises on the one hand, to improve regional connectivity and development, on, enhance efficiencies in transport, alleviate congestion, make firms more competitive, make the country more attractive for investors, and being a symbol of Kenya's ambitions, and I quote, to create an economy free from colonial influence, which is from the office of the prime minister, if I stand correct. So, but on the other hand, there are also concerns, for example, irreparable damage, the, the fact that 90% is funded by a foreign bank, and poor public and planning in participation, public participation in planning. So we can learn from our history that infrastructure impacts stem back from not only recent past, but in to the, the, the period when Africa was held by others under colonialism. With the long distance Nyamwezi trade caravans brought by Arab traders to Africa, the Uganda meter rage railway that led to substantial deforestation, land consolidation and hunting blocks, and also brought people from India and missionaries. But this led to a series of conflicts with settlers and later after independence and the structural adjustment programs, this led to the new revived so-called economic efficiency in 2013. And this has led to China's trade expansion, which has enabled Kenya to secure the loan to build the first and second phases of the railway. So we see a shift in balance historically. We can also look at the impacts of these, these such developments in, in other contexts on nat national parks or protected areas. So for example, if we look at Savo Conservation Area, this has also been shaped by infrastructure in fundamental ways. Stemming back to the first, the famous two man eating lions of 1899 and the first air strip in the Maktao Southern Gate to massive developments in tourism facilities, the growth of sisal plantations, land speculation, urbanization, wildlife conflict, as well as mining and sand harvesting. And if we look at satellite imagery, we can see in the last 50 years, if we apply a 30, um, 80 kilometer buffer along the railway, which is what you can see in front of us, we see that change has also been significant. For example, if we look at forest cover change, there's been about 72% forest loss. And much of this is, has occurred between 1990 and 2000. Similarly, we also see major changes in cropland, about 38% crop loss. And much of this is, is occurred in the last 10 years. Now let's consider current tools and pitfalls in their effectiveness. Environmental impact assessments are widely considered as the best project appraisal tools available with attempts to assess future impacts, leverage opportunities and mitigate risks. Yet the quality varies greatly depending on the nature of a proposal, the conditions of the receiving environment, the expertise of the authors and reviewers, the scope of the EIA, the time and resources available, and usually they are commissioned by the proponent or developer but rather than an independent body. So in essence, they are too narrow and they don't look at the whole and that's why having voices, bringing voices together under a common framework is where the scenario tool can be potentially useful. So we conducted an analysis of all the available environmental impact assessments along the standard gauge railway. And what we found were environmental, economic, social, and legislative oversights. For example, in terms of environmental oversights, there was inadequate scientific evidence to support assertion. For example, no detailed discussion on the on distribution and density of small to medium mammals inside the national parks where the railway was running. There was no discussion about the interaction and dependencies of different species, such as predator-prey relationships, dispersal areas, or pollination. 
and no detail of key methodologies, such as no underwater analysis of dredging sites. There was also no consideration of alternative routes alongside national parks. So for the Nairobi National Park, many will you, of you will know about, uh, that Kenya Railways Corporation settled on the modified Savannah Route 4, which ran through the park. And this had major impacts on land conversion, wildlife habitat and connectivity, subdivision, and, and indeed vis visitation rates. And I'm sure we'll discuss this further. In terms of economic pitfalls, in term, there was inadequate consideration of the likely redundancies, such as long distance truckers, freight clearing agents, loaders, and local transport. The figures here are shown in terms of one of the responses that were to the EIA. Farmers were also affected to, from construction. There was closure of roadside businesses, among others. And indeed, environmental costs were externalized. There was no com cost comparison to the value of protected area land and the broader impacts of ecosystem services. Social oversights are well known. Participatory consultation is always challenging, but there was inadequate communication and sensitization related to certain routes. And overall, the, the acceptability of stakeholders in terms of transparency and inclusivity in the planning and development was uh, limited. It, there was also inadequate consideration of economic displacement and relocation plan, particularly around Nairobi National Park in, for a resettlement action plan prior to construction, the, the compensation communities received for losses and the impacts on human wildlife on pastoral communities. Finally, in terms of the timing of the release of EIAs, they were often mismatched to construction. This is the cases of Likoni, Nairobi National Park, Ngong Tunnel, and even Mombasa. EIAs did not apply the precautionary principle, and this led to much public controversy of appropriate activities. And they did not define the independent monitoring and enforcement framework, uh, which would allow for long-term habitat management, including measures for climate resilience. So summarizing the available tools and some of the pitfalls, we now look into the future and we propose one tool that may help get ahead of the problem before it arises. We apply the Kesho spatially explicit scenario tool that aligns stakeholder visions of the future into to land use models. The key thing is to have a diversity in the room, resource users, NGOs, governments, representatives and planners that have the ability to harmonize and bring together common perspectives into one framework. In brief, it involves stakeholder mapping, boundary setting, narrative construction, land use modeling, validation, application, and iteration. So this is an example of a scenario planning process along the SGR in, we conducted in Kisumu. And of course, this is a work on progress and there will be maps showing land use change associated with these scenarios. They are based on two vectors, one of environmental conservation of water availability and supply and disaster risk reduction versus the degradation, low production and climate change and pollution. The second relates to good, good governance and urban planning, including connectivity and housing provisioning versus a corrupt society and poor land use man planning, traffic congestion, informal settlements and infrastructure de decline. So the best case scenario is we, we called a promising sustainable techno city. And this represents informed, educated, skilled population and a knowledge-based economy with its regional integration in East Africa and increased trade. The second scenario is the Great Lakes economic renaissance where there's investment in fossil fuel, agricultural mechanization and degradation and sedimentation of Lake Victoria. The third is the Kwekwe Republic or the Banana Republic, which is a worst case scenario where we see floods, droughts, cultural erosion, displacement of communities along the corridors and loose political structures. And finally, we see planning the con conservation conversation or fail, where we see the conservation of Lake Victoria, subsistence food production and the growth of small scale businesses. So these issues are different in the different regions, but the scenarios bring together these voices and viewpoints together, and you can still understand the local context. And that's why it could be a useful planning tool. In sum, some key insights can be gleaned from scenarios and other processes. Uh, and here we suggest an envisioned roadmap for future proofing development corridors. One is to plan strategically to align policies, plan for a range of direct and indirect losses. Where there are particular regions are in the most critical material areas and where there are equipment or materials that need to be supplied, we need to account for these, these impacts and the changes that climate will, will occur over the lifetime. 
We also need res responsive, resilient, and flexible services that meet actual infrastructure needs and allow for changes and uncertainties over time and promote synergies. We can consider how infrastructure is a means to advance environmental and social objectives and avoid risking stranded assets and, sus and sustain our partnerships. We need to, uh, assessing a full life cycle and, and avoid locking in infrastructure, investing in hybrid green infrastructure and the, the, applying the principle of biodiversity net gain, and that physical construction should not compromise ero e ecosystems, erode human rights or destabilize politically fragile contexts. And circularity and integration can allow for greater fiscal, institutional and technical capacity to adjust towards environmental path, future path, sustainable pathways. Integrated infrastructure optimizes systemic interdependencies with built-in redundancies that can allow infrastructure to continue to operate when stressed. Balance, equity and inclusiveness, employment generation and support local economy, supporting a local resource-based and labor-based infrastructure development, promoting fiscal responsibility, enabling transparent, inclusive and participatory decision-making that includes stakeholder analysis, ongoing participation and grievance mechanisms, and effective communication can boost morale and reputation, as well as build trust, acknowledging scientific and indigenous knowledge, engaging contextual nuances. And finally, we advocate for quality strategic environmental assessments, uh, as well as environmental impact assessments that incorporate scenario planning, as well as contingency planning and monitoring. In conclusion, investments in development corridors of Africa are at an all-time high. Current tools are not fit for purpose. We offer tools and approaches that can exploit development corridors with multifaceted opportunities in a range of sustainability visions. Scenario planning can lead to equitable sharing of benefits for future generations. With spatially explicit representations of future change, they're a useful planning tool to illuminate mitigation measures, winners and losers. They identify sources of uncertainty, uncertainty, magnitudes of these uncertainties, and how they propagate from one phase of investment to another. They actively, scenarios help actively challenge assumptions by applying system thinkers, think thinking. And it's intrinsically a collaborative process that builds trust, sharing of information, and is, which is a recurrent challenge in, 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 that arises in environmental impact assessments. So it can help transition from linear transport corridor like the SGR to a much more wholesome futures oriented development corridor and try and foresee impacts. I'd like to close with a quote from Friedrich Nietzsche that the future influences the past, the present as much as it influences the past. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Jessica. It's a, a great, uh, a great quote to end on, and, <laughs> and certainly at the heart of uh, a lot of the work we do. Um, um, we were planning to have another sort of post presentation poll. I'm not sure if that's uh, a possibility. Just I know the um, the previous poll uh, didn't work, um, but we were just really ah. Oh, Perfect, it does, as if by magic. So there is, you should all see a, a poll uh, occur on your screens. This is something we're going to let go in, in, the, in the background. Um, and it's really just about where we feel as though the intervention um, is most appropriate, you know, in terms of trying to understand the scenarios of impact of change that occur as a result of a, a development corridor. So is it best to have that intervention at the planning stage, at the design stage, at the construction stage, when it's in operation, as it's uh, as it's occurring to be monitored, or at the end of it, so we can look at a sort of post hoc um, appreciation of of the impacts that have happened. Um, so again, please feel free to uh, engage in that poll. Um, before we move on to the um, question and answer. Um, session and discussion session. There was a couple of points of clarification I just wanted to pick up. Clearly, as we can see, this is work in progress. Um, I mean, Jessica's done a, a great job so far in, in running and hosting um, six workshops across the range of the SGR, engaging, you know, 100, I forget exactly, 180-ish 
people from a whole range of different backgrounds in those six workshops. Clearly there's a really deep and rich narrative there uh, that needs to be brought together and ultimately will play out in terms of land use maps for the future. So in the same way that Jessica showed those historical land use maps uh, of past changes that we can pick up from satellite data, the idea is that we will then be able to move those forward into the future in those four scenario boxes uh, and then use those in a planning way. Um, very much it's around uh, a conversation. You know, the process starts with a conversation in those workshops. We're going to continue that conversation now. Uh, and that's an ongoing process. Um, and there will be a dedicated period of the project for about three months, most likely early next year, planning as much as we can plan in this current uh, world that we're, 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 li we're living in. Um, where those um, results will be disseminated to a wide range of stakeholders, many of them who, who participated in those workshops in the first instance. Uh, there was a couple of questions around the availability, so all of the uh, insights, the databases will be made available. Uh, again, they're work in progress. Um, I think the database that Jessica mentioned with just about nearing completion, so that will be done within the next couple of weeks or so. Uh, and again, once that's accepted, it will be uh, publicly available. All of the slides from all of the talks are, are going to be available, uh, as is a, a recording. And again, if anyone wants further information, don't hesitate to ask any of the Development Corridors partnership teams. OK, well, what I'd like to do while that poll keeps on running is just move across to our, our three panellists. We're lucky to have um, um, a great range of expertise from sort of Cordio, from the Wildlife Foundation, from CETRAD. And I'd just like to pass across um, to, uh, to, to David from Cordio to just explore a little bit about this utility of looking into the future. I know you've had some experiences of scenario and futures thinking from sort of working coastal Kenya. Um, just, you know, what is your perspective? How do you see uh, the future of engaging with these different stakeholders? How do we get these different voices into the room? Um, to really look at the impact on, say, natural assets on development. Yeah, thanks very much, Rob. Um, good afternoon and good morning to everyone on the call. Thanks for having me on this and having the chance to speak to you. Um, so, yes, my name is David Obura. I'm, I'm a director of Cordio East Africa. We're a, a non-profit research organization in Mombasa in Kenya. And a few years ago, we focus on coral reefs mostly, but we also look at broader coastal uh, sustainability issues. Um, and about four years ago, with WWF in Madagascar, we, we led a scenarios process looking at, at coastal uh, sustainability issues. Um, I've, I think I'll, um, because I see a lot of people are based from here, I'll perhaps just put my, my name and a, and a website in, in the chat so you can have a look at those. And they also sort of um, match up a little bit with the scenario uh, axes that Jessica just uh, presented. But I'll get to that in a moment. I mean, we found that, I found it very enlightening doing the scenarios and I, I really sold on the process. Um, I'm very interested in large scale landscape and seascape processes and, and they're complex. Uh, there's a lot of uncertainties around them and there's a lot of differences of opinion looking into the future and a lot of people have embedded assumptions and i think particularly where you have a lot of different interest groups and uh, you know interacting scales and uh, actors sectoral groups it's very powerful to have a scenarios process because it lets you it lets people think a little bit more into the future and think through somebody else's shoes, consider things that they wouldn't have considered otherwise. Um, and then that helps to identify both potential problems that might come up in the future to avoid, but then also synergies and, you know, um, people that you have aligned interests with who, who might not have been clear without a scenarios process. So 
I think that's very important when looking at natural assets, uh, such as the development corridors process does, because, you know, particularly in, in Africa, um, and we're dealing with this right now, actually, a continental group with the Convention on Biological Diversity, is that nature is really one of the most important assets we have that, that people use for their livelihoods, um, you know, for their for local economies, even for the national economy. You know, if, if, if our natural systems are not healthy, <clears throat> we lose a lot of the benefits that, that we get directly, but also that come through investments and, and, you know, financial markets and things like that. So scenarios really help looking at, look at the consequence of, of decisions and of actions, one's own decisions, but also those of others, and to think how to steer a, a, a good pathway into the future. I think a particular we, we did not involve our, our scenarios process, didn't involve the SGR, but we were looking at, you know, marine and coastal assets as in terms of major infrastructure as well for urbanization, for port development. Um, it would be really interesting to sort of take that forward, perhaps look a bit more at Mombasa and the, you know, the end of the SGR and, and what, you know, what further possibilities are there for steering how it goes in the future. But we used or asked the participants in our process identified two main axes. So we set up two main axes of, you know, naming and identifying these scenarios. And we used the type of governance as, as one of those, as, as was done uh, in, the, um, in the example we've just seen. But then the other one that we used wasn't environmental status, but it was the level of investments. You know, if there's, if there's a lot of money, um, you know, to invest in development or if there's very little, but also the type of money, does it come from, you know, good sources or conscientious sources versus um, other sources? And we came up with a coastal focus. We sort of had, you know, of course, the four axes as well, the high governance, high investment uh, option was the blue economy model that we're all talking about a lot, where you do have investments and you have very conscientious investment um, and protecting the natural assets. And the one that was low governance and low investment, we called the pirate ship. We used the maritime analogy. So it was quite, it was quite a fun process to go through to identify these sort of cartoon stories. And you can see them on, on the website uh, if you have a look at that afterwards. So I think it's very, and this last thing I'd say that was very useful about scenarios is two, two things. Um, scenario processes that are very broad based and involve uh, all the stakeholders. The key thing is le the legitimacy of scenarios and thinking of the futures, because you have to involve, you know, all of the stakeholders, all of the right groups, because if they're not involved, of course, they might, they might doubt the process. So if they're not involved in a scenario or in a, you know, an EIA process or a strategic environmental assessment, they may contest the outcome. I think it's very important for legitimacy that scenarios processes can help do that. And then the second thing is that even if the scenarios are a little bit, um, you know, cartoonish in some ways, um, you'll see the ones that we developed are very much dressed up that way, partly because they're a little bit politically sensitive. Um, but it, it actually changes the mindsets of those who are involved in the process. It really helps the deliberation and, and the discussions amongst stakeholder groups and listening to one another. So, um, so yeah, I'm, I'm very interested in, in, in seeing after we come out of this long sort of COVID process, we haven't been able to do much work on the ground, how we can then move forward and, and the next steps in thinking about development corridors and our, and our processes in, in Kenya. So thank you very much. Thank you, David. And uh, yeah, I, I agree entirely. I mean, natural assets really has to be at the heart of sort of development. And uh, increasingly, we can see, you know, if we get the development corridors right, you know, those natural assets can be enhanced and, uh, you know, and enhanced in an equitable and more just way. Um, and, and clearly, that's one area that we particularly are interested in and why we use land use and uh, understanding the land use classification and maybe transformations in land use as a way, as a way to look at issues around natural assets. Um, and again, this is really where I want to maybe bring in Patia from the, from the Wildlife Foundation. Um, and land, you know, I know, you know, through the evolution of the new constitution is a, is a contentious issue uh, in many countries and particularly in, I know in Kenya. Um, and often, um, particularly say some of the pastoral communities um, where land um, tenure is maybe a bit more uncertain, there's maybe more communal land use. Uh, 
how do you feel we can better capture uh, and utilize the value of land? I mean, do you have any particular experience from your um, foundation's work? Um, clearly, I know there's always these interactions between, say, agricultural development, um, livelihood development, wildlife, um, and then these types of infrastructure developments that come through. So really the question, um, Patia, is around, around land and how we can maybe better capture the value of that land um, and the communities that utilise that land so that people aren't um, you know, impacted more than others from this process of these development corridors. Over to you, Patia. Thank you, Robert. It's Patita. I know it can be confusing, but it's Patita. Uh, thanks for this opportunity. Um, I was sitting back here going through Jessica's presentation and just relieved many moments of the struggles that we had during the SGR. And um, as you have clearly said that um, the indigenous communities uh, depend or their livelihood is based on the biodiversity. And um, with what happened with uh, most projects like the SGR is the abrupt um, disruption of our way of life, which is dependent on, on land, as you clearly said. And uh, she clearly put that there was lack of public participation, no modes of engagement for stakeholders. But those are the challenges that we had over time during the SGR project. And um, as we move forward, I think um, the SGR project brought in a lot of challenges that, of course, we had already had experienced, but not in that magnitude, because we did not have a project that would run across the country or half of, of a, a landscape that was uh, mostly on indigenous people's land. And uh, based on the experiences we've had in, in the past with the SGR project, we have had to review some of the way in which we do things and there's a model that we developed called the free prior and informed consent, which is a model that we are working very closely or have already worked very closely with other partners to try and bring conventional modes of development and the indigenous way of management of resources, just so that we could marry and bring about the experiences and the knowledge to give communities and indigenous people an opportunity to be able to put the indigenous knowledge into practice. Because as, they, as these projects come, then they find already an established system. And once it is disrupted, then it means there are very many after things that come. Um, and planning for future, the, the trainings and the discussions and the consultations is more about the way in which we have planned to use our resources. And as the projects come, then how do we slowly convert those areas that can be converted into other ways of livelihood production and those that remain in the way in which that we had already planned for future use. And the free prior and informed consent model has given us an opportunity to at least share our experience and knowledge with communities living up north of Kenya, because that's where the Lapset project, the, the, the oil pipeline that comes from Lamu all the way to Ethiopia is going to go through in Sudan. And the experiences that we learned on, on, on planning for resources that we use publicly and those that are used privately, like pastures, water, then those are the things that we are already engaging the communities up north to begin to map out, to begin to share these plans with county governments, with national governments. And, and also the, the grazing plants. What is our wet season grazing? What is our dry season grazing? So once these resources are mapped out early in advance, it uh, is sort of then shared with stakeholders to bear in mind that there are things that cannot change. And, and if they are to change, you take another 50, 60, 70 years. So then they begin to understand what our plans are, what are the challenges we are anticipating? What are those, that, what are the things that can be replaced? For example, if, if, you, if, if the only thing we are, we are giving away is um, a water source, what is the alternative? So sharing this um, indigenous knowledge and, and experiences over time and over the years and sharing those plans and the uses of the natural resources that we have within our ecosystems. Then factoring in like what someone talked about the dispersal areas. Those are those that we want to protect because 
there's where the cattle move and it is where the, the, the wildlife move. It is a uh, uh, mixed use. It's not only the, the where livestock will go through is where the wildlife will go through. So protecting them is a win-win situation. And, and, and also bringing about what, the, the, what sorts of economies or livelihoods are, protect, are supported by this landscape just to bring in um, the value of, of our biodiversity. Because in most cases, they look at the infrastructural development forgetting that just the infrastructure that you are uh, uh, bringing onto this landscape, do not forget that uh, there has been this economy sustained over time by the way, by our way of life and, 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 and conservation. So I th the experiences and, and, and I would say uh, the scenario planning has been very useful in, in mapping out of the resources, sharing indigenous knowledge and sharing all that information way in advance with the relevant stakeholders just to protect uh, some of these very delicate ecosystems. So I think by and large, I have just shared those experiences and, and the protection of of, of, of uh, as, as she mentioned about the gaps in information and the gaps in action, especially with the EIA, with happen, what happened with the SGR, there was no sufficient time to engage the stakeholders. So EIA, EIA sounds like a very scientific tool, but in actual sense, when you go to indigenous communities, they have an EIA, just not called an EIA. So it is, it is digesting some of these things so that the communities then begin to slowly taking some of these changes and that they're expecting to, to, to experience and so that they do not come abruptly and cause the, 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 the disruptions. And even planning for these actions to avoid the, um, the clashes that would have, the unnecessary court process that we had to really go through, which was really expensive. And to even understand the partners that are funding the programs. What, 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 are, their, what are their beliefs? What do they, what do they want to reach? What goal do they want to achieve? And see where we can give and take. So I think mostly for us is the lessons learned and taking them just to use them for the Lapset and other upcoming programs that might affect indigenous people. Thank you very much, Patita. That's uh, yeah, really good insights. And, uh, and clearly, you know, as Jessica mentioned, these in investments, uh, you know, of course, are increasing, and it's likely they're going to increase into the future. Um, and clearly, we're, we're, you know, we're behind the curve a little bit on the SGR, but the idea is we're developing these tools so that for those future, um, you know, investments and corridors that happen, you know, maybe we can, you know, have those conversations much earlier on, make the EIA process much more effective by incorporating these types of tools. Um, but again, that's it. This is an ongoing conversation. Um, you touched a little bit on the issues of community views, and this is where I really want to bring in, in Caroline um, from CETRAD. I know CETRAD have been working for a long time, particularly around that sort of Mount Kenya, engaging with communities, so particularly on issues of water. Um, and really just from your experience, I mean, how do you feel, are there particular tools that you've been engaged with that CETRAD have used to really get those community voices into the decision-making process where they feel comfortable, where they feel as though they're represented, where they feel they're welcome. You know, again, there's, you know, segments of the community as well, making sure that, you know, everybody's voice is heard. Are there particular lessons learned um, that you would like to share, Caroline? Thank you for the opportunity, uh, Rob. You're I'm Caroline, Caroline Oko from CETRAD. And uh, just speaking from my colleagues and uh, focusing on the presentation from uh, Jessica, uh, why do we do development? Why all these processes? At the end of the day, uh, we want to empower the community and improve their livelihoods. However, this is not a one stop. You, you can't do it once and get the results you're looking for. It's normally a process. Uh, so in order to get uh, community views and uh, adequate community participation, it is imperative that uh, you undergo a process using different tools at different stages. And uh, for the development corridors, and uh, because uh, we met with Jessica during the 
scenario planning, this was done. Ideally, you map and characterize the stakeholders and uh, community members are a very key stakeholder. And when you do this, you get to know their roles in the development uh, project. When you do this, you follow up with uh, acquisition of opinions from them. And this can be done uh, using tools like surveys, focus group discussions, and you use the opinions to then promote their participation by creating the necessary events. Uh, for example, uh, the participatory scenario planning is a very key tool in ensuring that uh, the voices of the community members is heard and is incorporated. But you have to do it right because you need to have a two-way feedback. And uh, Jessica did a lot of mapping. And when she's during the mapping process, they bring in the historical perspective. They bring in the indigenous knowledge. And after this, when you've gathered the opinions as a researcher, you then compile this and you give them the feedback. And when the members are able to see their contributions, then that in inspires them to be comfortable and to contribute more. So the trick is to ensure that they understand the free and prior informed consent comes into play and you also empower them so that whatever they are sharing with you is usable. So uh, using uh, infographics like the maps was very helpful because they can actually trace where their homes are. They can show you what has been happening over time. So all this is a com of combination and it is a process. So I just want to emphasize that uh, community members have a lot of knowledge, the approach you use and uh, engaging them uh, sufficiently so that you have a very realistic um, conversation and you are able to do your research in a manner that everybody can benefit. That is the ecology and also the personnel as well as the economic aspects. It's a lot of trade-offs and a lot of balancing, but participatory scenario planning has proven to be very, very critical. Thank you so much. Back to you, Rob. Thank you, uh, Caroline. And clearly, uh, as you mentioned, it's a two-way process. It's a multi-directional process. Um, and it really starts with the conversations that I know Jessica had, say, across the, uh, the SGR. Um, and I say these conversations are continuing. Obviously, today is part of that continuing um, dialogue. Um, and I say there will be a whole period of focused dialogue as the scenarios are completed um, towards the end of the year and into next year. Um, and clearly, as I mentioned at the start of your intervention, Caroline, you know, these investments are not going away. These new infrastructures aren't going away. There's a lot of good that comes off them. Um, you know, the, you know, access to markets, I know, being terrified once on a bus to Mombasa or several times on buses to Mombasa and uh, now I can, you know, you can do that journey in, a, in three hours in relative comfort. Um, so there is a lot of good uh, that come from that, but again, it's really about maximising, um, maximising the good. Clearly, I just wanted to quickly return to the poll. Unfortunately, we're out of time. We had some really good questions coming in. There was quite a lot of questions around the EIA. We will follow up on all of these. Um, either Jessica or myself or the, the wider Development Corridors Partnership team or Patia and David, Tita, sorry, David and Elizabeth can come in. Um, clearly, there's an overwhelming response, 93% of the audience, and I think we had just over 100 people on the, on the webinar, suggest that it needs to take place in that planning phase. So really right at the beginning. Um, and clearly that boat has, has sailed in the context of the SGR, um, and we are very much playing catch up. But the idea obviously is that this railway is heading off towards DRC and eventually will link up uh, in West Africa. Certainly it's not going to be the only railway across the continent. Uh, there are many more planned in the coming decades. 
uh, and clearly we want to make sure that they can happen in a much more inclusive way where communities are engaged, those conversations um, take place. Okay, uh, as I say, unfortunately, I don't think we have any time for the questions, but, but thank you very much for, for posing those. We will follow up on those individually. Uh, there is uh, a recording of the, uh, the webinar on the, um, the YouTube channel. The slides are available. All of the databases and the outputs from the project will be publicly available. Um, and let's say these conversations will continue. Yeah, I see there's just some links coming in into the, into the chat now uh, that you can follow up on. Um, but by all means, do follow up with myself or Jessica. Um, this is the second of four webinars that the Corridors Partnership is, is planning in this particular phase of the uh, sort of project outreach events that uh, Amaya is, is leading us on. Uh, the next we shall hear from um, Tobias Nyumba. Uh, Tobias is jointly hosted between the African Conservation Centre and University of Nairobi and he'll be talking around environmental safeguards uh, for linear infrastructure. Um, and then uh, we'll be rounded out in the uh, middle of September, 13th of September I think it is, by Catherine Sang from the University of Nairobi that will be particularly looking at that natural asset of water and how water resources have been impacted on by um, some of these uh, linear infrastructures, particularly the SGR, and I think a little bit around some of the LAPSAT work that, uh, that Caroline and uh, Petita were talking about. Okay, well, it's bang on the hour now. Um, so without much further ado, I would just like to thank, well, certainly Jessica's great presentation. Uh, really good to see the work in development. As I say, it's, it's an ongoing process. Um, so really good to, uh, to talk through at this stage. I'm sure there's plenty of food for thought for the, uh, for the, for the, for the final push on, on finalising the scenarios. The conversations will continue throughout the rest of this year and into next. Thank you very much, uh, Patita, um, David and Caroline. And of course, our, our hosts, um, Laura and Amaya. And uh, certainly, I say that conversation will continue, and uh, I shall close um, the webinar now. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you, David. Thanks, Patita. Thanks, Caroline. And um, thank you, Jessica. And uh, yeah, have a good day, you all, and look forward to continuing that conversation. Asante. 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 Mm -hmm.